Boston. Good night. Let them think that they are now listening to the center of a hotbed of sin and degradation. You know, there's 400 million people out there figuring that one day they are going to discover what sin is. You know, how many times have you felt that cheated feeling? I mean, you pick up the paper and it's on page three and it says 47 nabbed in fantastic vice rate. And you look at this and you see these guys being hurried into the wagon. They got their black glasses on and they're holding up copies of the Paris Quarterly, you know. And you feel cheated. I missed another one. I missed another party. Well, this is a problem that all of us have to face. We as Americans, we as Americans are a very special breed of cat. Oh, yeah. We really are. And, and on a Saturday night, as we sit here quietly eating our cheeseburgers, and you can hear, if you listen carefully, the listener out there, you'll hear the sound of girdles creaking. It's all part of life in America. Out there right now at this minute. Let's, let's, let's pause before we get started. Let's give them a moment of simple commiseration. Out there in the darkness right now, there are 400 million Americans heading along the turnpikes on a Saturday night, aiming at debauchery. They're heading for the Howard Johnson. <laughs> this is an American's idea of really going all the way. As a matter of fact, out in Indiana, I can tell you on a Saturday night, they can measure what kind of a Saturday night it is by how many interchanges you ride over on the, on the turnpike. If you're really going out, it's a three interchange night. You just drive on the turnpike. You know, turnpike driving has become an end in itself. It's not where you go that matters. In fact, right now on the New Jersey turnpike, you can buy little beanies that say souvenir of interchange 12. <laughs> with a propeller, you know? Or you can get a little hat that says souvenir of Route 9. I've been there. And so now, at this moment, let us pay simple homage to those pilgrims in search of passion who right now are heading for the drive-ins of the world, who are heading for real life as seen on a wide screen with their little rusty horses on the side of their on the side of their Mustangs. How about that little rusty horse? I kind of like him. Have you ever, you know, one time I got an MGC, a real little low car. And if you ever look at the bottom of cars, as you're whistling along the turnpike, you can see dreams personified. I remember one time I'm driving along the turnpike, see this little low car, and all of a sudden this monster pulls up next to me. And we're both going neck and neck. It's on the Pennsylvania Turnpike. And on the side, it says Oldsmobile Jet Star Stream Super 88. And it's rusty. And I can see it sort of half hanging off. And I'm riding along there, and I'm saying to myself, is this the dream? Is this as far as it goes? Well, maybe it's because in America we live a special life. And I just got back from the Negev Desert. Are you interested? <laughs> All right. You are now going to see the other shepherd. Are you prepared? Now, wait a minute, honey. You just sit there and be quiet and object when I give you the cue. This, shut up, will you, or leave. Look at this. Now, wait a minute. Look at that. Look at that. All right. Can you imagine walking into your boss's office Monday morning like this? You arrive. You can see it gives you a very different aspect. You notice how tall you walk. Yeah. Now, if you want to prepare for sandstorms, Here's the way this... Oh, by the way, look at this. Can you imagine walking into a union negotiation? <laughs> you know, you just sort of carry it in. You don't say anything about it. You just open it up and pare your nails with it. 
Well, I'll tell you, I'm, I'm down, I'm down in the heart of the, I'm down in the heart of the, the Arab, the Bedouin Bazaar, in the middle of Nazareth, and it's a long, narrow, twisting, involved street. It's about six feet across, see. And as you go step by step, you get deeper and deeper into another world. And you get further and further away from America. And each step, the smells get more subtle. Oh, yeah, I'll tell you, there's stuff you wouldn't believe that smells, Frank. Oh, yeah, and, there, and when you get a fantastic montage of these smells and these aromas, it does something to your soul. And I go into this Arab Bazaar, see, this little tiny shop. And you know, I'm a typical American. There's a certain point when you think you're hip, and then all of a sudden you encounter something totally alien, and all your hipness departs. And I walk into this place, see, and here is this Arab sheik. He's got this tarbush on. They wear it like this. It's worn, thrown around this way, see. And I walk in, and he says, ah, you are the American. I say, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah, what can you say, you know? And he says, come into my shop. Let us sit down and speak of what perhaps you would like to take home to America as a little gift. And so we sat down, and immediately he brought out this Turkish coffee. And we sat at this tiny inlaid table. Me looking at him, him looking at me. And then he said, what was it you desired to take home as a souvenir? And there was a slight flicker of his shoulder. And I saw a figure behind in the darkness appear from behind the beaded screens. It was this fantastic alabaster dream. What a chick. Woo! And she had these almond eyes. And she just appeared for an instant, and then disappeared. His eyebrow flickered just slightly, this little flick. He says, is there anything you see? <laughs> I says, well, uh, <laughs> he says, that is exactly what I thought. Now let us speak. What was it you want? And I could see by a flick of his left hand, that it was expected of me to discuss water pipes, which were over here all piled up marked for tourists only. And I said, uh, how about a water pipe? <laughs> he says, ah, I see you are a man of taste and discretion. And behind us, I could hear this oriental this Arabic music begin to play. I can hear the sound of those pipes. And boy, I can feel my blood boiling. And he says, I can arrange to have whatever you wish sent to you duty free. I says, duty free? duty free. I said, well, <laughs> and we settled back for a long moment like that. And then there was a sudden moment, a sudden instant. And once again, I see this alabaster form. This time, it's another alabaster form. He says, I have much in stock. <laughs> Little did I realize at that moment that I had engaged myself in a subtle bargaining a subtle but very, very well-established pattern. I was about to buy, gentlemen, the ultimate souvenir. <laughs> haven't you, as an American, uh, as a traveler, haven't you wanted someday to bring back the one thing that said it? Yes. yes. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and you get it back home and it just turns out to be a rotten little vase. You know, just a crummy vase, and you see him up and down 42nd Street. And you've logged it back in your bag 6,000 miles, and that turns out to be a rotten little vase. And you take pictures. We all have the desire to bring back the ultimate. 
Well, I am sitting with this Arab sheikh, and he says to me, he says, of course you realize that these things take time. I said, how much? He says, it depends, it depends on the sort of negotiation that you wish to enter into. Do you wish to pay cash or do you wish to charge? <laughs> Little did I realize how spectacularly successful my diner's club card could be. <laughs> you would be surprised at the things that you could charge on your diner's club card, friends. You'd be surprised. I've been in places that I expected any minute now to hear the heavy tread of the law and above it, it says, carte blanche, cards honored. <laughs> well, I am sitting with this guy for 15 minutes. And we are talking back and forth with this subtle innuendo of two old, experienced men of the world. Until finally he says, the deal is complete. It was a pleasure to do business with you. Her name is Fatima. <laughs> Of course, you can call her anything you can. <laughs> she prefers Fatima. And I said, Fatima? Fatima? Oh, boy, wouldn't they love to see Fatima in Hammond, Indiana? <laughs> yes, Fatima. Little did I realize that I could get her not only duty-free, but I could get her disguised as a lamp. <laughs> That's how she's coming in. And it was that, it was through a long, involved, subtle negotiation like that that I finally achieved the ultimate. I don't know how long the law is going to let me get by with it. I don't know, but I've had that moment of fantastic success. I'm waiting now for the call from the American Express Company. I wonder how she'll be wrapped. I wonder what you say, you know, that first moment. Come, Fatima. Come. And a, a true slave. It was that way, and it was, it was the most fun I've ever had. I don't think anybody has ever bought a Doberman Pinscher and had as much fun as I had. You didn't know they sold dogs in the Arab Bazaar, did you? Well, I've made my peace, and I'm going to continue to live with it. You know, it's a funny thing about, about people about when you travel out and you learn about your land, you know. I am in the middle of this, this fantastic scene in a, in a town north of Tel Aviv. This is another time when you discover yourself. And it's a low mud hut. And I've been taken in by this guy who says, you really want to see how the native world lives? And I says, yeah. And so we go into this place. It's all lit with purple lights. And I could see people lounging on the floor. And there's guys wearing tarbushes. You ought to see an Arab when he's in his full regalia. They wear shades. You ought to see a, an Arab in his shades. <laughs> that is an Arab in full heat. Two o'clock in the morning, here they are. They're lining up. They're all in this dark place. And I can see these shades. And I can hear the tinkle of little bells somewhere in the distance. And I can smell some subtle aromas, which even by just smelling them, I know they're illegal. <laughs> you know, I know that's a bad scene, see? And I step over these bodies. I'm in this dark den of iniquity in the Middle East. We've all, we've all vibrated to that. And out of the darkness comes this man who runs this thing and he says to me, what is your pleasure? What is your pleasure? <laughs> what are you going to do when somebody asks you that in the middle of a, what appears to be a den of decadence, a decadence beyond measure? He says, what is your pleasure? And the only thing I could think of is, you got any Cokes? <laughs> It's terrible being an American. <laughs> I'm telling you, we're very uncreative sinners, you know? So, in the middle of all that, you know, I'm sitting there and I'm thinking, holy smokes. I can remember my mother. I'm a little kid, see? 
Well, this is one of the one of the one of the remembrances I think that that clouds are thinking about places like that. I can remember my mother as a little kid. She's got this fantastic hang up. And what is it on? It's on Gary Cooper. And why is it on Gary Cooper? I can remember going to this movie with her. She used to take me every afternoon to see this same picture. We followed it all around the, the Midwest. Every afternoon she's off, she'd take me. And it was a picture with Gary Cooper in the French Foreign Legion. <laughs> the French, what was the name of that picture? Did any of you ever see that picture? Was that Beau Jess? Gary Cooper had this big hat, you know, with the thing hanging down the back. And my mother had this idea in her head that if she could only get to the desert, <laughs> Gary Cooper would grab her. Either that, or if she could get to the desert, Rudolph Valentino would grab her. My mother had an idea that she could see herself being carried away on a horse, you know, off into the desert to this tent made out of camel hair, see. And you know, she used to stand over, I remember she used to stand over the sink after one of those afternoons with Gary Cooper in the French Foreign Legion, and she's wearing her rump sprung bathrobe. <laughs> but she's got an orange bathrobe. She called the Chinese red. And it was an orange rump sprung chenille bathrobe. And I can remember her standing over the sink, see, and it had dried egg on the lapels. And she's got her Brillo pad in her hand. My mother was the only mother I knew who slept with her Brillo pad. I'm telling you, she kept it in a shoulder holster, you know? <laughs> and I can remember her really, seriously, I can remember her standing over the sink. It's, she's had a big afternoon in the French Foreign Legion. And the sand is still coming down out of... It's, it's coming down out of her curlers, you know? My mother had her... <laughs> I don't know what he's been up to, but <laughs> I'll tell you, my mother had her hair up in curlers for 26 years. You see, she figured that when something really big came along, she'd take it down. <laughs> and right now, tonight, my mother is sitting up in curlers. It has not happened. And so I can remember her, seriously, I can remember her standing over the sink, you know, her rump sprung bathrobe on, and she's got the Brillo pad. And we had one of these sinks, you know, we had a sink that ad-libbed. Oh, yeah, yeah, we had, we had a sink, you know, the sink at, at crucial moments in family arguments, which were always held in the kitchen, you know, these long pregnant silences. Yeah, my old man is sitting there in his underwear. My mother is opposite him. My kid brother is under the table whimpering. And I'm sitting there eating a red cabbage, see? And the old man is bugged about something. His underwear is open. There was these paws. There'd be a long pregnant pause, and all of a sudden, the sink would go... It really kills the point of anything that happened. You know, my old man has just made a big point, and that's all I've got to say about it. And he's sitting there for a minute saying, let that sink in, you know. When the sink goes, oh. And it would, it would sort of throw up, you know. See, our sink somehow was connected with Bruner's sink next door. And the Bruners lived like pigs. And all of a sudden the sink would go, oh, and up would come a dead fish, you know. Or an apple core, some rotten thing. And my mother would look over at the sink, and you could see, you know, it's funny, you know, those little vignettes, you could see across the driveway, you could see another little pane of light. It was the next house where Mrs. Bruner is bending over her sink 
and she has just thrown the apple core in her sink, and it's now laying in the middle of our linoleum. And my mother would jump up and she'd say, oh yeah, and she'd stop stuff in our sink. Pour the water in it, and, this, and the sink would suck things in, you know? They'd go, ah, ah, and it would all disappear. And then you'd see Mrs. Bruner. Oh, life, I'll tell you, man. And I remember my mother, you know, those moments after long afternoons with Gary Cooper. I don't know whether people in showbiz know how much they affect all the rest of them out there. We call them the audience, but they aren't reading. They're just individual little jocks, little tiny kind of bundles of desire and dreams, disappointment, buggedness, passion. There's no such thing as an audience. And here's my mother. I can remember these nights. She's bent over. She's got her rump sprung bathrobe on. And, and still, you know, it's funny. You know how after you've gone to a movie, how it sticks with you for about two hours? You know that terrible feeling of after the thing, you know, the, you see the end come on and Dimitri Tiomkin's music rises? It goes, bum, 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 bum. And you see Tony Perkins, that fantastic figure of a man. <laughs> He's the only guy I knew who has padding on his padding, you know. And you see Tony Perkins striding off the screen nine feet tall, and he's got Audrey Hepburn in his arms, and you see him going up into the mountains, and you sit there for a second, and two and a half minutes later, you're out on the street. <laughs> you know, you're back out here where real life is. You're knee-deep in cigar butts. Have you noticed that, that Tony Perkins never seems to have trouble kicking beer cans out of his way? You know, that would be a great moment in a movie. <laughs> now that I think about it. Let's take somebody really ethereal. Let's say uh, Ingrid Bergman. Or Debbie Reynolds. That's even better. No, Doris Day. <laughs> I can see Doris Day entering the subway. <laughs> And she's with James Garner. You know, have you ever had the feeling he's carved out of soap? You know, 99 and 44, 100% pure. He's carved out of a bar of Life Boy, and she's carved out of a bar of Ivory. And can you see these two coming into the subway? Passing one of the signs you pass every night. Real quick, like, you know. Well, I'll tell you, I can see my mother. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, I, I, have, I have a sense of, of responsibility to the audience because I can see my mother, see. We have seen Gary Cooper. And you know how it is in the Foreign Legion. Oh, they play hard and fast. These are men who live hard and die bravely. These are men who stand on the parapet. I remember that scene. You remember that fantastic scene where one by one they're getting picked off? these guys in the French Foreign Legion and the Toregs are going up and down the hills. They're picking them off one after the other. And wasn't it Victor McLaughlin that was piling up the dead bodies to look like they're still fighting? Until finally there's only two of them left, you know? Holy smokes! Boy! Well, my mother has had a full afternoon of that, see? You can see the sand trickling out of her, out of her curlers, you know? And she's wearing her rump-sprung bathrobe like a tarboosh. <laughs> and you know, she's in Purda. You know, oh yeah, have you ever seen how Purda is? Oh, you see these chicks walking around, you know, and it's like this. Oh, you'd be surprised what that does. Yeah, and she's standing there, you know, she's got her bathrobe up like that. And she's working over the sink, and she gets very silent. People who get involved in these things get very silent afterwards. And she's silent, see? And I'm sitting over there by the, by the table. I'm a kid, you know, and I got my meatloaf. I got my red cabbage. You know, and I got my Ovaltine. Oh, by the way, <laughs> how many of you ever listened to Tom X? Yeah, and his Ralston Rangers. I'll never forget wanting one whole year a box of Ralston. Because I came from an oatmeal family. 
You know, Ralston was always advertised as having a nut brown goodness with a nutty flavor that Tom and Tony, his horse, both eat every morning. Yeah, and Jane and Jimmy, too, and the old Wrangler every morning. And then I remember getting my first bowl of cream of wheat, my first bowl of Ralston, and it tastes like jazzed-up oatmeal. That, that slow settling in of, of, I suppose you can call it, ah, what is the word? Vague knowledge that it's all not what it seems to be. And my mother, of course, is still, I think the women are the great romantics. That's why men have so much trouble with them. You know, they, they marry images, not men. And here she is bent over the sink, see? And once in a while the sink goes, ah. Oh. And she sort of pushes it down. She's pretending it's a camel. <laughs> you know, that makes it better, see? So she's hanging over this thing, and she's very silent. I'm a kid, and I'm eating. And my kid brother's eating. And there's that kind of, you know, that nice, nobody's paying any attention to anybody else feeling in the family kitchen. I'm eating away. My brother's eating away. And by the way, I had the kind of brother who didn't eat. He'd go through periods when he refused to eat completely. Absolutely, just would sit. And it got to the point, I remember, where my old man used to say, you won't eat, huh? And he'd grab him by the back of the neck. He'd say, give me this screwdriver. He'd pry his mouth open, and he used his kerosene funnel on him. I can remember him pouring the, pouring the red cabbage down the funnel and putting it down. The kid brother's eyeballs bugging. He learned to eat, I'll tell you. He got so he was mainlining mashed potatoes. So, you know, you live in this kind of world, and, and, and it's one of those long afternoons. We've seen, we've seen Gary Cooper, or my mother is still riding those fantastic long hills of the dunes, when all of a sudden, the back door slams open, and there's the old man coming in. You know, our neighborhood Toreg, our Bedouin, he comes pouring in, he says, I'm home! And he starts taking off his clothes. And my mother just turns around, she says, yeah. You know, I said, what do you mean, yeah? She says, yeah, I see, you're home. I see. And then he turns around, he says, what have you been doing? Have you been at them damn movies again? And she says, none of your business. And then I hear him stamping off into the living room. And he says, if I ever catch that Gary Cooper, I'll hit him in the mouth. He don't even know how to ride a horse. And my mother says, that's what you think. And he says, well, I bet he can't play pool. My mother says, that's all you can do. And then there's silence. And then I hear the sink go, ah. Oh. And there is the vignette of what showbiz does to the living, breathing protoplasm of the audience. It splits them. We'll be back in five minutes. Let's hear it. Come on.